Hi, I'm George Aguilar, and this is the first edition of First Edition, the All Things Comic, Film, and Pop Culture Podcast. First up, I'd like to discuss some new and exciting news. Starting with what's got me most excited, and that is that Garth Ennis and Steve Dillon's masterpiece, Preacher, has finally been put into production and will most likely make its debut on AMC, the same network that brought us The Walking Dead, Mad Men, The Breaking Bad, and still airs the best Halloween month programming ever. The project is being produced by Seth Rogen, Evan Goldberg, and Sam Catlin, and will air on AMC. Rumors of casting are already in high gear, and we'll talk more about this a little later when I get a, give a little more background and pros and cons of this. Another major announcement that will definitely have fans talking is the Avengers 2 casting of Paul Bettany of Priest fame, who will join the cast as a Vision. Bettany has ties to another major Marvel movie franchise as Iron Man's computerized butler, Jarvis. It will be interesting to see if there is any connection. And earlier this week, fans were shocked by the Man of Steel 2 casting news, as the roles of Lex Luthor and Alfred Pennyworth have been filled. Jeremy Irons is Alfred Pennyworth, and the major surprise casting of the part of Lex Luthor will be played by Jesse Eisenberg of Zombieland. Although I read a lot of internet backlash about this casting, as many were hoping for a Brian Cranston of Breaking Bad fame to be the one to shaving his head. I'm kidding. I'm actually kind of interested to see what Eisenberg does with the role. He seems to have the look of a genius intellect down, but I'm not sure what kind of physical threat he can pose for the likes of Superman and Batman. Guess I'll have to wait and see. And lastly, we all know the second half of The Walking Dead Season 4 airs tonight on AMC. With promises of more death and destruction in the wake of the Season 4 first half finale, the rise of Carl, and the possibility of a certain baseball bat-wielding maniac appearing on the show. I'm excited to start watching the show again. And in today's comic quick review, I wanted to talk a little bit about The Walking Dead and Cross Badlands. I just read the issue 120 of The Walking Dead, which is part 6 of the storyline All Out War, that has Rick and his group of survivors against the equally capable forces of Negan and his group, the Saviors. This issue picks up right after the events of the previous issue, and in an Empire Strikes Back fashion, Negan manages to show why he's a major threat by quickly throwing Rick and his group into chaos. Without giving away too much, I'll say this issue has a lot of action but is over way too quickly but leaves you wanting more for sure. There are some great character moments from Rick, Jesus, Maggie, and Negan. I also read four issues of the Avatar comic series Cross Badlands. Written by David Latham and Jason Burroughs, issues 10 through 13 show the earliest days of the Crossed Outbreak told from the perspective of a cowardly teenager called Yellow Belly. Let me start by saying this is the most graphically violent comic book I've ever read. The graphic depictions of violence and mutilation actually haunted my dreams. There's a particular two-page comic spread that I may never forget involving the cross after their takeover of a circus. While it was almost too terrible to look at, it was strangely arresting to the point where I couldn't look away. This series is definitely not for the faint of heart. With that being said, I thought the story was very interesting from the angle of Yellow Belly's perspective. This could have easily been another run-of-the-mill zombie-infected outbreak story, and for the most part it kind of is, except for the fact that it's told from Yellow Belly's point of view. This changes the story dynamic immensely, because he's not a hero trying to do the best he to maintain his sense of right in the chaos. He's an outright coward whose actions actually cause the death of others. This will probably have many screaming at the comic, at how someone can allow such atrocities and keep going. And yet it's strangely realistic. Yellow Belly represents the fear in all of us and the willingness to protect ourselves even at the expense of others. These four issues also take place in the early days of the crust outbreak and show how quickly the infection spread. Another interesting note is that issues 12 and 13 cross over with the previously published cross story, Psychopath, by including a character named Carol Lord who encounters Yellow Belly and offers him perspective on the New World Order. This is a great read if you can stomach the graphically violent material, give it a shot. Up next, I want to discuss some of 2014's upcoming comic films. First, let's start with Captain America The Winter Soldier. Opening on April 4, 2014, The Winter Soldier is Captain America's next solo effort after Captain America The First Avenger. Adapted from a major comic storyline by Ed Brubacher and Steve Epting, the Winter Soldier deals with the return of a major threat from Captain America's past. After viewing the trailer, I've noticed this movie seems to have a much darker tone than the first, and will include many supporting characters from the Avengers, as well as introducing 
the longtime ally of Captain America, friend and teammate, the high flying Falcon, played by Anthony Mackie. I'm also excited for the inclusion of Nick Fury, played by Samuel L. Jackson, and Black Widow, played by Scarlett Johansson. I've also read rumors stating that this film ties directly into the upcoming film, The Avengers Age of Ultron and Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. show. And coming early May 2nd, 2014 is the widely anticipated Amazing Spider-Man 2, starring Andrew Garfield as our favorite wall crawler, Emma Stone as the blonde beauty Gwen Stacy, and introducing Jamie Foxx as the main antagonist, Electro. I'm already excited for the film and the inclusion of a costume that seems ripped from the pages of the Ultimate Spider-Man. Without spoiling anything, I hope, there is also talk of Spidey taking on not one or even two, but a whole sinister group of villains. From the looks of the trailer, the Spider-Man looks to be trying to outdo the last in every way. Finally, the film I've been waiting for since reading the comic is finally making its way into theaters, this May 24th, 2014. X-Men Days of Future Past returns Brian Singer to the director's chair of the X-Men franchise, in a sequel to both the Wolverine and X-Men First Class. He'll be taking over for Matthew Vaughn, who directed X-Men First Class, and is now serving in a producer's role. The film is a crossover event between the younger X-Men of First Class and Singer's cast from the original films. Starring Hugh Jackman, Patrick Stewart, Ian McKellen, Michael Fassbender, James McAvoy, and Jennifer Lawrence, among many others, the premise of this film sees the X-Men of a dystopian future ruled by giant mutant hunting machines make a last-ditch effort to prevent this future by going back in time to prevent it. We'll also discuss this film and comic in more depth a little later, but I wanted to touch on it in the upcoming releases. Alright, now back to Preacher. I gotta say I'm actually very excited this property is finally under production, after a decade in development hell. I'm actually more surprised Watchmen was adapted before Preacher because it's another property that languished in development hell for so long. For those who have never read or don't know what Preacher is about, Here's some background. Preacher tells the story of a tough-as-nails former minister, Jesse Custer of Texas, who is on a mission seeking answers from the one being in the universe who can answer them, God. Armed with only his iron will and a powerful presence that is bonded with him and gives him the power of the word, Jesse's quest will take him to the end of the world and back. He is also accompanied by the equally capable, as she is beautiful, Tulip O'Hare, and the Irish vampire Proinsus Cassidy, who forms a strong bond with Jesse. Over the course of the 66 issue series, with many side stories and specials, Jesse and his friends encounter some of the strangest and most terrifying characters to ever grace the pages of a comic. Air Star, the twisted grandmother Mary Laangel, the Saint of Killers, Jesus the Sad, Lord of the Gamora People, All Father de Aronique, and the good hearted Arsface are just some of the characters Jesse encounters on his journey. Now that we have some background, I'd like to go into more depth about the coming show. I have a few concerns to say the least. While I'm excited it's finally in production, I'm not sure how I feel about it being adapted by AMC. Don't get me wrong, they're a great network and they've brought us some great original series over the years, such as Mad Men, The Walking Dead, Breaking Bad, The Killing, and many others, but personally, I feel like they've offered us a watered down version of The Walking Dead. As a massive fan of the comics and a devoted fan of the show, I have to do my best not to compare the two, because when I do, I feel a little disappointed by what the show could have been had it followed closer to the comics. Those who are fans of the comics and the show probably feel the same way, especially with the handling of Andrea's character and the Governor's story arc. The comics make the show seem a little bit like a Saturday morning cartoon when compared to the level of violence and atrocities committed in the pages of the book. And herein lies the problem. While AMC has done an admirable job of adapting the comic for a wider audience, Preacher is arguably more violent and more controversial than The Walking Dead ever could be. With themes ranging from wild sex orgies and hillbilly cannibals, to the patron saint of killers and the offspring of a union between an angel and a demon, this story doesn't pull any punches when it comes to the sheer number of controversial themes it tackles, and therein lies its charm. Preacher is what it is because of every controversial topic it covers, and that's why I'm afraid if AMC waters it down for major audiences, it'll be a huge letdown. I mean, you can't have Preacher without the anti-religious themes and the direct social commentary and all of the underlying themes that shine through every page of story. So while I'm happy Preacher is finally being adapted for television, I'm holding my breath to see what kind of Preacher story will be coming to TV. 
That is, unless of course they get Clint Eastwood to come out of retirement to play the Saint of Killers. If that were to happen, then I'd know the show is in good hands. Another beloved comic adaption I'd like to talk about now is X-Men Days of Future Past. Days of Future Past is my favorite comic book story of all time. Originally written in 1981 by Chris Claremont with artwork by John Byrne and ink by Terry Austin, spanning a whole two issues, 141 and 142, Days of Future Past shows what happens if the X-Men fail in their mission to unite humans and mutants. Without giving away too much of the story that will soon be adapted into film, Days of Future Past chronicles the last ditch effort of the few remaining X-Men to go back into time and avert the dystopian future ruled by Sentinels. I love this comic because it not only has two beautiful covers that are some of the most iconic covers in comics history, but the story is equally memorable. From the start, the readers left in awe by the visage of a future ruled by the mutant hunting Sentinels and the mortifying images of what's become of the last remaining X-Men. I was a huge X-Men fan as a kid. And my first encounter with this storyline came when I saw the X-Men animated series where Bishop is sent back in time to prevent the future. From there I remember seeing pictures of the covers of Uncanny X-Men 141 and 142 in Wizard Magazine. I'm sure some of you still remember those. And I was completely blown away. Issue 141's iconic wanted poster listing all of the captured or slain X-Men with a defiant but much older Wolverine standing his ground to defend an older shadow cat. And where 141 surprised and left me in awe, 142 filled me with terror. The title of issue 142 was, This Issue Everyone Dies. And it had a massive sentinel blasting Wolverine to death while squeezing the life out of Storm. And that issue is one of the best written scenes I've ever read, where Colossus cradles the body of a fallen teammate and enraged by the loss unleashes all of the rage and anger in a last hurrah. That scene and many others left me in a state of sadness, thinking about how much these fictional heroes had sacrificed and given of themselves and fought so hard just to end up on the blasting end of Sentinel's giant hand. It wouldn't be until I was out of college before I would actually find an affordable copy of issue 141, but when I bought it for 10 bucks at an antique store, it was the best $10 I'd ever spent. This storyline means a lot to me, as I'm sure it means a lot to others. So that's why I had my doubts when I saw the preview for the upcoming film adaption. Brian Singer's adaption of X-Men Days of Future Past looks to be its own beast, yes the puns intended, altogether. The focus again will be on Wolverine, Professor X, and Magneto, as well as the massive merging cast of both Singer's X-Men 1 and 2 and Bond's X-Men First Class stars and a few newcomers. Without giving away too much detail, there are major differences that will become apparent once viewed. And while I'm okay with changes, my impression of the trailer left me with more questions that may lead to doubts about the film. For instance, the costumes of the future X-Men. My thoughts, my first thoughts were, for one, I guess we're going back to black again. And then two, why does everyone have such clean and spiffy looking uniforms? To address the first thought, I really enjoyed X-Men First Class and one of the choices that made me happy about the film was the decision to at least try and offer a uniform that resembles the comics. The classic yellow and navy blue looked great on camera, and I was hoping they would continue to try and adapt classic costumes for the film in a post-Avengers movie world. After viewing the trailer, it's apparent that they seem to default back to black, with everyone but Michael Fassbender's Magneto who has a very cool Ultimate X-Men-like suit, and Mystique who went back to walking around naked. Okay, so they went back to black. That doesn't bother me so much. What does bother me is that all of these suits look pristine, and from what I can see, uh, they seem to show no signs of wear and tear. This sounds out to me as absurd because these heroes have been at war for years. If they're lucky enough to have costumes that could survive years of war, okay but I imagine those costumes would look more like tattered remnants of costumes rather than pristine suits. That's one observation. Feel free to comment with what you think. And while we're on the topic of costumes, I know a lot of people have had some strong feelings about Quicksilver's outfit. I'm trying to keep an open mind on it, but my initial feelings were less than great. I also read about a rumor that was later confirmed how Rogue had maybe one scene in the whole film and that she'd been cut. Singer called the scene an embarrassment of riches. 
This is after she appeared in the trailer and then a few weeks later on her own cover of Empire Magazine as one of their commemorative 25 cover X-Men Days of Future Past coverage. All of this back and forth stuff is already strange, but what strikes me as odd is why Rogue is barely in the film at all. Since we know she survived into the future and she's easily one of the most powerful X-Men, I think she should have had more of a critical role in the film. Rogue has the ability to absorb not only the life force and memories of anyone she touches, but also their special abilities if they have any. We saw this on screen in X-Men when Wolverine impelled her and she absorbed his power and healed herself. In a recent X-Men comic, she also absorbs the abilities of many of her teammates in order to combat and defeat an extremely powerful enemy. Therefore, I think Rogue would most likely be the greatest asset the X-Men would have on the battlefield, along with Professor X Magneto, of course. Especially in a war-type setting, I wouldn't bench my most powerful weapon. Another aspect of the film that has many potentially worried is the sheer number of characters involved. While I'm excited to see so many awesome heroes on screen, I feel that they'll have glorified cameos at best. The previous films have shown a direct effort to only focus on a few, usually Wolverine, Professor X, and Magneto. And while X-Men First Class did the best with juggling a large cast and dividing up the screen time, Days of Future Past is too huge with too many characters. And I feel many of the characters who aren't Wolverine will be left with little to say or do. With that being said, I'm actually very excited for this film, and I'm sure it's going to be awesome. Some of the things I've seen and read have just given me a little cause for concern. Nonetheless, I can't wait for the film, and I'll be there opening day. Okay, well that's a wrap. Come back next week and we'll talk more about comics, film, and pop culture. Hopefully sometime soon this podcast will become a video cast. whenever I finish purchasing the rest of the items I need. I'm George Aguilar, and thanks for listening.